The following is a presentation of TFNN. Time to talk about your health. Living a primal lifestyle. You know, we have Tom on from Tampa on the phone. Hey, Tom. Good morning. It's bright and early now, huh? Hey, thanks. Hey, uh, how you guys doing? Nico? Doing great. Good. Hey, uh, your newsletter is outstanding, man. I'm, I'm telling you, man, it is outstanding. And so is the run of my I love that stuff. I'd never be without it. I mean, I've been on it now three, four months, man. I mean, it's just I can't get over how good I feel. Primal Edge is, uh, no, people are raving about it. People who are trying it, they know because you can feel it. We'd not be without it. Call now. Toll free at one 877 6648 now your hosts nico dehan and paige clark good morning welcome to living a primal lifestyle where we explore a return to a more balanced and natural wild world to recover our natural health and regains our rights and freedoms i'm nico dehan that's a beautiful morning in downtown uh, st petersburg it's actually 79 degrees and very humid out and uh Paige is out today. She's on vacation up to Lake Tahoe, so I hope she's enjoying herself there. Meanwhile, we're here stuck uh, waiting for the storm to come, and I guess it's never going to really come. Just to give you an update on this, uh, this is Dorian right here. Uh, 105 mile an hour winds with gusts up to 120, or excuse me, 120 mile an hour, gusts up to 135. Uh, minimum uh, central press is at 90 point, 9,500 millibars. And it's uh, moving uh, nearly stationary as it has been for quite a while. Got another one here in the Gulf uh, that is about 48 uh, hours from being uh, a storm. They say about 100% humidity, uh, chance of uh, being a storm here. 35 uh, mile an hour winds right now, and the pressure is uh, 1,006 millibars. And uh, we have one out in the Atlantic here, and the one just beginning off the Cape Verde Islands, which is uh, about 90% going to form into some kind of storm. So a lot of stuff going on. Uh, Dorian, of course, uh, is still a threat to a lot of the USA here. Uh, we're not aff affected too much by it here, which is kind of nice. Just a little mild breeze. So uh, wish us luck. You never know where this thing is going, and, you know, and part of the thing what we're going to be doing today is to really talking about how people behave and uh, how the food really changes when things like this happen. Now, I've been following Ben Davidson from Suspicious Observer for quite a while, and it's a good thing uh, to see his. If you go to suspiciousobservers.com, you'll find out every day there's a, um, a little brief on the weather, and it's really about the sun. So he starts with the sun. And if you followed him over the last few days, you know that the sun had a lot of uh, activity going on, and it really followed the, uh, the storm, and it actually actually changed the direction. So if you listen to him, and if you go to his YouTube channel, if you just touch YouTube right here, that'll take you to the YouTube channel here. And then if you go to show more, you'll find he has three movies here, Plasma Cos Cosmology. And this is really talking about uh, what people are thinking now the sun is actually made of a plasma, and plasma is the th kind of the dark matter thing that's going around. He has another one here on Cosmic Disaster, and this is uh, the disaster predictions uh, that we've been following is that every, about every 12,000 years, the sun does a what they call a mini nova, where it's kind of pushing its shell away towards the planets. And it, uh, a lot of havoc going on here. And of course, the last time this happened was during the Younger Adrias. And you know, that started the, the Ice Age. And the last one he had was climate uh, forcing, and that really talks about pollution and what, what's really happening with the climate. And uh, you'll find out there that he's thinking that it's going to much more cold than it is going to be uh, warm. So I suggest you l uh, listen to uh, Ben Davidson and also on his main site here, you find a lot of activity, learning about the sun, energy from space, learning about the grand solar minimum, um, dark matter is dead, sunspots, what sunspots and earth spots really mean. An earth spot is really kind of like a tornado or a, a hurricane. And talking about the number one risk to earth. And here he's talking about uh, the path uh, forward at uh, one of the conferences. And the, the new conference coming up is uh, in, uh, it's in Denver in, uh, I think, the 6th through the 9th of uh, August next year. 
I'm going to be speaking at that too, so that's kind of nice. Folks, please pick up our Primal Edge and also remind you to pick up our Health Signals newsletter. I have a new one out now. It uh, talks about how the brain senses glucose and a lot, lot more is in here. So pick that up and uh, maybe we can learn something about uh, our kids' lunches, what we're feeding people around the planet, and uh, nutrition science. And so there's a lot of stuff in here that uh, will help you, including some recipes and things like that. So it's real interesting. So today I really wanted to talk about some of the things that uh, happened when we, and here's an article here too, can the sun produce more powerful storms on earth? And this tracks the storm that we are just going through and it shows you how the different things that happen on the sun actually are directly related to how these storms move. So it does give us a good indication. We don't know where the storm is going, but as it's happening, you can kind of figure out why it's doing these things. And I think that's kind of important. And uh, of course, the type of things that Ben talks about on his uh, show lately has been a lot about the disasters that go on uh, every 12,000 years on this planet. But also they go on, seem like uh, there's less disasters uh, for a period of time, then boom, all of a sudden, like 5,000 years would go with the Noah flood that happened about 3,500 B.C. or thereabouts. And of course, during hard times like uh, the, the Younger Adrias, things change. We know that in uh, the United States uh, and North America, particularly, large of the large animals went away. So when uh, our primitive ancestors were hunting these big mammoths and these big animals here on uh, North America, and those things are gone, now you naturally fall back to the next best thing, which is whatever the animals are left here. And uh, if that's gone during another disaster, then we start leaning towards plant foods and things like that. So that's kind of where we're heading today in our talks. So I wanted to bring this one up for you, talking about colonization and food. And the violence that accompanied the um, uh, European colonization of the indigenous people of Mesoamerica is well-known fact. Historians have elaborated on the devastation effects such colonization had on the indigenous societies, cultures, and their mortality. While the study of the conquest has generally focused on the social and political and economic changes forced upon these indigenous populations, the matter of food, the very sources of of uh, survival is rarely considered, yet food was a principal tool of con colonization. Arguably, one could probably understand colonization without taking into account the issue of food and uh, eating. And just imagine if you're a Spaniard, nearly arrived on the coast of a foreign land, your survival depends on two things. Security, protecting yourself from danger and nourishment, the food and other substances that are necessary for survival. In the terms of uh, the former, Europeans arrived on the coast, what is uh, referred to now America, fully equipped with the means to protect themselves. They had horses, they armed with weaponry that we, they didn't have over here, and a bunch of European diseases. Uh, the Spaniards engaged the indigenous population in many different violent ways, and nourishment, however, was another matter. So we'll discuss that when we come back. So stick around, folks. Please pick up some Primal Edge during the break. And uh, I'll be right back. You know what's cool? Taking something that's good for you. Something specifically formulated to help with weight loss, better sleep, stress reduction, and the need to detox. Nico, our hunter and gatherer ancestors found all their nutritional requirements for health in their wild environment. But today, our food sources no longer contain the vitamins, minerals, and nutrients our bodies need to stay healthy and strong. That's why we need Primal Edge Daily Nutrition. It includes a special blend of ionic soil-based vitamins, minerals, fatty, and amino acids in an easy-to-use liquid form. Primal Edge is powerful by highly concentrated fulvic and humic acids, nature's preferred delivery system. They have been called miracle molecules because, like sunlight, air, and water, life cannot exist without them. That's right, Paige. They ensure we receive all the nutrition we need to be healthy and thrive. We, we take, take it, it every, every morning. morning. Primal Edge, formulated and approved by Nico and Paige of Living a Primal Lifestyle. Buy it today for just $89. Click on the Primal Edge banner on the front page of TFNN.com. 
TFNN is excited about our new software charting program, The Art of Timing the Trade Charts. In collaboration with Tom O'Brien and using his best-selling book, The Art of Timing the Trade, Your Ultimate Trading Mastery System, David White has programmed an outstanding piece of software that will complement any trader's methodology. Using this first-of-its-kind program, The Art of Timing the Trade Charts allows you to scan thousands of stocks for Fibonacci formation setups, including Gartley's, ABC's, Butterflies, and much more. The Art of Timing the Trade Charts is designed to help you when scouring the markets for stocks just beginning to form the trading patterns that many investors spend days, weeks, or even months searching to find. And right now, we're offering licenses available at only $79 a month. We are so confident that you're going to love this new charting software that will even give you a 30-day unconditional money-back guarantee. Don't miss out on this incredible new piece of software. Get your copy of The Art of Timing the Trade Charts today by visiting TFNN.com. Will the S&P 500 continue to climb? For bold trades on U.S. large cap stocks in either direction, trade SPXL, SPUU, or SPXS. Direction's daily S&P 500 bull and bear leveraged ETFs. Direction leveraged ETFs. An investor should carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risks, charges, and expenses before investing. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus contain this and other information about Direction shares. To obtain a fund's prospectus and summary prospectus, call 866-476-7523 or visit directioninvestments.com. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus should be read carefully before investing. An investment in the funds is subject to risk, including the possible loss of principal. The funds are designed to be utilized only by sophisticated investors such as traders and active investors. Distributor Foresight Fund Services, LLC. Call now, toll free at 1-877-927-6648. Internationally at 727-873-7618. And welcome back to the show. Um, we're talking about the Europeans uh, that believing that food shaped their colonial body. In other words, the European constitution differed from that uh, of indigenous people because the Spanish diet differed from the indigenous diet. Uh, further, their bodies uh, could be altered by diets, thus the fear of being consume, uh, consuming inferior indigenous food, the Spaniards would eventually become to like them, but in, at first they didn't like them at all. Only proper European foods could maintain the superior nature of the European bodies, and only those right foods would be able to protect the colonizers from the challenges posed in the New World. In the minds of the Europeans, food was not only function uh, to maintain the body superiority of the Spaniard, it also played a role in the formation of social identity. In other words, uh, for an example, in Spain, the elites consumed mostly bread, meat, and wine. The poor in Spain could not afford such luxuries and instead ate such things as barley, oats, rye, and vegetable stew. Even the vegetables were classified and based on social status. For example, in some cases, root... Uh, the vegetables were not cons uh, considered suitable for the elite consumption because they grew underground. The elites preferred to consume the foods that came from trees, elevated from the filth of the common world, so to speak. And this uh, food served as an indication, indication of class. Uh, in addition, at the time of the conquests, uh, Spain was facing uh, internal divisions of its own in, in uh, an effort to expel the Spanish Muslims as well as the Jewish people from Spain. King Ferdinand uh, V and the Queen Isabella I relaunched what was known as the uh, Reconquesta, the Reconquest of Spain. Uh, a strong uh, Spanish identity, uh, identity formed around this and food uh, became powerful symbol of the Spanish culture. For an instance, uh, for, uh, consider pork. Among Muslims, Jewish, and the Catholic, only Catholics could eat pork, since for Muslims and Jewish people, people the consumption of pork was forbidden. During the reconquest, as individuals were forced to prove that they had pure bloodlines, they would uh, often be or offered pork, and a refusal to consume pork would be taken as a sign that people were not true Catholic Spaniards. 
and they'd be expelled, they'd be persecuted or even killed or probably moved off the main, uh, moved into the New World. So as the Spaniards they arrived in the New World and initiated the uh, colonization of the Americas, they also brought with them the notion of culture and class based on distinctions that were founded on the types of food that people ate over there. Uh, for example, those who consumed guinea pigs were considered Indian. The same was true for some of the other staple indigenous foods, such as maize and beans. The Spanish considered such indigenous fare as famine foods. And I think, too, if we go back even further, these were probably the famine foods that our indigenous people used. Because remember, to switch from a lifestyle of following the food and having kind of the freedom to move with the food and killing the animals and then using just vegetables and things as an afterthought, maybe to flavor them, uh, used as medicine by the medicine man, this provided with just about everything we need. But when times get tough, the animals don't come. It's harder to follow them because of the weather. We have storms like we have now. Things like that, we tend to not move so much and now we're changing the food because maybe the animal food ran out. Out, so now we're going to consume some of those things that we are just using for our uh, minimal parts, for flavoring, for extending a small amount of the food. But now we have to extend a lot of larger amounts of food. And of course, this is what the Europeans were doing all along, because remember, the poor people were always stuck with the rice and the barley and those things. And the bread was really the uh, higher class at that time, because it had to be made by people. And uh, to make it on your own is another big step. And remember that farming itself is very labor intensive, while a hunter can work maybe three or four hours a day, the farmer has to work eight to 10 or more hours. You have to put up fences, you have to repair the fences. You don't want am animals trapping through your corn or wheat field or your rice paddy. So you have to have control of the animals in order to, order to control that. And of course, when the weather comes along and ruins the crop, now you're stuck. So these were, I believe, what uh, the indigenous people were calling the maize and all these things already in their society they had these things and they were using them as part of the traditional diets and I think a lot of these traditions were passed down because they saved your life this is part of what I'm going to be talking about at the uh, observing the frontier next year is putting the food together with these disasters that we have because if you're hunkering down for a hurricane maybe you don't have electricity you're not going to be cooking and now you're you have the prepared food all ready for you or maybe it's easier to uh, eat the plant food it's you don't have to cook it as much or maybe you don't cook it at all who knows um, the symbol nature, symbolic nature of food has also been present in a religion, uh, which is another devastating aspect of the conquest. Uh, among Catholics, uh, the, there was a wafer made of wheat, uh, which signified the body of Christ, and the wine, of course, which signified the blood of Christ. Initially, before wheat was harvested in America, it was difficult to obtain wheat from abroad, uh, since much of, much of it is spoiled in transit. The wafers that were necessary for the rite could easily be made from the nat native maize, but Spaniards believed this was inferior indigenous plant that could not be transformed into the literal body of Christ. And uh, so, you know, there was the dilemma for those people. If the Spaniards and their culture were to survive in foreign lands, they had to make a ready, ready use of some of the uh, sources of the right food, which they couldn't get anymore. So sooner or later, the Spaniards discovered that beans and maize and things like that weren't the foreign food as much as it was a transition from their food into... And remember, they brought foreign food with them too, including all the bugs and, you know, the smallpox and things like that. That's not food, but it's something that probably devastated, they think, at least half of the population before we even moved west. So think of the Spaniards <coughs> landing in Florida, <coughs> the English landing in uh, New England, and right away the diseases really spread across and probably the whole country uh, before we each, uh, even reached the Mississippi River. So, you know, half the population was gone from these people. So here we have now the indigenous people being uh, terrorized by these foreign diseases, not knowing, and I'm sure, entire uh, cultures were wiped out from that. Uh, let's see. 
So another uh, number of domesticated animals were present when Europeans arrived in what is now known as Latin, Latin America. Among the indigenous uh, things were things like dogs and llamas, alpacas, guinea pigs, turkeys, uh, Muscovy ducks, and a uh, different type of chicken. Uh, in Mesoamerica, any meat uh, and leather was consumed or utilized, usually came from wild game, and generally there were no animals exploited for labor, with the exception of dogs, who were at the time used for haulings. European considered this lack of proper animals for work cons uh, consumption unacceptable, and thus the first contingent of horses, dogs, pigs, cows, sheep, and goats arrived with Columbus's voyage of 1493. The arrival of these hooved immigrants would fundamentally alter indigenous life forever. Yeah, it would certainly change, and all of a sudden you got all these animals here that you hadn't seen before. Of course, the horse was here previously and had uh, been terminated probably at the Younger Adrias event 12,000 years ago, but now they were reintroduced, and this really helped the indigenous people here, that's for sure. So stick around, I got a lot more. I'll be right back. would like to tell you about the personal training studio that Nico is the owner and president of, Performance Training. Since 1998, Nico has trained individuals and groups to improve their health both mentally and physically. As a certified personal trainer, Nico's main focus is on demonstrating exercises correctly to avoid injury and teaching his clients how to manage their past injuries while getting the most out of their personal training sessions. The Performance Training Studio is filled with unique training equipment that enhances balanced results at a faster rate while minimizing damage and discomfort. For more information, you can give Nico a call at 727-418-8740 or email him at nico at tfnn.com. Let him know you heard him on TFNN and save up to $100 on a special package just for TFNN listeners. Act today. If you're not currently using the TAS Profile Scanner when looking at setting up your trading opportunities, then your arsenal is short a mighty weapon. The TAS Profile Scanner is a standalone piece of software that instantly filters over 2,500 global financial markets such as stocks, ETFs, commodity futures, and Forex. Headed by Steve Dahl, TAS understands that in today's technological world, the use of top-flight software applications and technical analysis expertise is essential to successful trading in today's market. You also gain access to the webinar that Steve Dahl and Tom O'Brien just hosted, The Best Way to Use the TAS Profile Scanner to Profit. This webinar archive is available for all subscribers immediately upon signing up. All new subscriptions also come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have nothing to risk. Start your subscription by visiting the front page of TFNN.com today, and you'll find the TAS Profile Scanner under the Services tab. Sign up today. Are you in the market for buying or selling real estate in the Bay Area, including the surrounding St. Petersburg, Tampa, and Clearwater markets? Tiger Real Estate LLC is a firm that has extensive experience in the Tampa Bay Area. Whether you're looking to sell your current property for maximum value, or you're in the market for a second home or investment property, Tiger Realty has the experience across all areas of real estate in the Tampa Bay Area to help buyers and sellers make the most informed decisions across all price levels. From the price you should be paying per square foot in certain up-and-coming areas to the type of cash flow investment properties are capable of creating, Tiger Real Estate can help you make the best decision when it comes to all areas of the market. Before you make one of the biggest decisions of your financial future, call Tiger Real Estate LLC today at 727-329-8322 or email us at tiger at tfnn.com. That's 727-329-8322. Call us today. This segment is brought to you by Think or Swim. For more information, just click the Think or Swim banner on the front page of TFNN.com. And welcome back. So the introduction <clears throat> of all these new animals and all these different uh, foods were kind of being passed back and forth. Of course, the animals being brought over from Europe played a big role in how 
uh, the colonization took place because the horses really made us travel a lot easier. And of course, it gave the Indians back some of the momentum that they used to have uh, before they were doing it all on foot. And all of a sudden now, they're back on horses and uh, things are happy. But the food and the diseases are really what changed uh, the Americas here quite a bit. Oops, got something going on here. So the introduction really was not good for uh, the uh, indigenous people here. And uh, dairy was brought in, the sheep, the goats, the pigs. Somewhere between 11,000 and 8,000 B.C., uh, this practice was in Northern Europe as well as Pakistan. The practice of consumption was milk and cheeses and things like that. Had been done thousands and thousands of years ago by the Americas, but uh, little domestication has gone uh, here in uh, the uh, Americas. Mostly just the, uh, the dog here. And then up in uh, probably South America, I think the alpacas and the llamas and things like that were used for be beast of burden. So food is really a lot of power, too. So when you take the food away from the indigenous people, they're getting sick. Uh, some of the European foods that the Europeans are used to isn't available here, so the Europeans are getting sick. So it's not a good thing. And also during the 16, 1700s, when we were colonizing here, of course, we were going through a solar minimum, a quite large one. And for about 100 years there, there was a lot of bad weather going on. So people were scrambling for food. People People were dying everywhere, and it probably wasn't very pleasant. So I've got an article here that a lot of people are going back and taking a look at what indigenous people were eating and maybe learning something from it. I found this site here from this gal it's called mindbodygreen.com, and this is the author here. And she's a chef. And she's making wave in the culinary world by cooking from roots as a part of the indigenous tribe of the Lakota. Uh, they spent a few years learning about uh, what people ate and how they cooked it. So uh, I guess it wasn't this girl here. Maybe she's just a show. Oh, this was who it was written by. Okay, so the author really uh, was taking it from Chef Sherman, uh, C uh, Sean Sherman. And he's cooking more like the Lakotas. While eating like one's ancestors is the cornerstone of well-known paleo uh, movements, Sean's story is more in-depth and personal and connected to his particular environment. The founder for the cuisine is understanding the basics about uh, who, what made up no, uh, Native American food systems from the past. Some people use the term pre-reservation or pre-colonization or pre-contact to describe this diet. From our perspective, it doesn't mean 1492. It uh, means that people weren't having contact with Europeans all the way up to the main 1800s. Of course, we landed in 1492, but really didn't cross the uh, Mississippi until the 1700s, and maybe into the 1800s we started really doing it. He says, I started taking my time to get to know the plants in my region and learning if they're edible, medicinal, or working in some way. It's much like dyeing or ropes and things like that. We get all these things from plants. The indigenous people are really good at figuring out what to do with everything that was given to them. Whether they were groups foraging, it didn't really matter whether they were using the animal products or they were using the uh, vegetables and the roots. They were using everything. Uh, the hunting and fishing, he says, was easy to figure out because those animals mostly are still around today. Uh, he says, we try to hold on many of the indigenous food as possible, but we can make certain allowances for the positive things like honey or dandelion. It's better for them, for the great food sources. That's this, uh, it's better to use them for the great food sources they are since they're so high in nutrition. He says, back in the day, there was no obesity, there was no tooth decay or any of, of the type 1 or 2 diabetes among native indigenous people until they were removed from the traditional food systems and given food by the American government. So that's really what happened is that once we put the uh, Indian on a reservation, now we change their food. Remember the story about the old Indian who goes up to the guy who's dip dispensing the, uh, in this case, the grass-fed beef, which we think is so good today. And he says, how come we're, you're feeding us this inferior food? And uh, the, the guy who was distributing it the colonel, whoever he was, saying, indigenous, this is the finest beef there is. He says, yeah, but the, 
the animal's in jail. And no matter how s small the jail is or how big the jail is, it's still a jail. So the animal loses its spirit. So the Indian really got a lot of, uh, of the spirit that he feels he got from the animal was passed down to him. And when you take that away, imagine, you know, that's, that's their religion. Their religion is based on the food and based on what they used and based on the weather and the sun and everything like that. So they use these things. And when you start taking this away, it's like uh, if you're Jewish or Catholic and now all of a sudden, no, you can't pray anymore. You can't do this anymore. And you have to eat this stuff that I'm feeding you. So it really put a, a damper on uh, the indigenous species. And if you think about it, if we had like 200 million indigenous people here just in the United States, and we think we're down to maybe 20 or 30,000 these days, and they're still dying because they're still on reservations, the children are still be, being taken away from them, it's not a pretty sight. So he says, I figured what kind of dishes I wanted to do and the ingredients uh, and uh, he found that the food is extremely healthy. The native people's main crops were different varieties, corn, beans, and squash. There were also melons and sunflower seeds from my area. Uh, he said the hunting and easy, uh, fishing, of course, were easy to figure out. But we tried to hold on to as many indigenous food as possible uh, because that's where the nutrition is. Because there was no tooth decay, because there was no obesity, because there was no uh, of the in the inflammatory diseases, uh, this food became so important. And the food we use is wild and carefully processed. There's nothing with chemicals, nothing with GMOs. It's about keeping the food simple and wholesome. It's not over-processing or trying to make the food taste like something different than what it is. It also promotes food parity among communities by popularizing these foods that used to be here. And he gives some sample dishes. So what about some future diets and things like that? What is really going to be happening now with the food the way it is? Uh, we have this big push to take uh, certain foods out of our diet, like the meats, mostly. Uh, so that's one of the big pushes here. We know when there's disasters, we always give the simplest food to the people. If we go over to the Bahamas now and we want to drop off food, nobody's going over there with a barbecue and feeding them ribeyes. We're going to uh, drop some corn on them, some wheat, some rice, stuff that they can fix themselves because it's the easiest thing to do. But it's always the lower populations that get this food. It's the rich that decide to have the extravagant meats and then pair that with some other stuff to make them unhealthy, who like the breads and things like that. But I think it's a real cause for concern. So when we come back, I want to discuss uh, you know, about some of the things that's happening in our society. Because if you look at pictures from the 1950s at the beach and you take a picture now, uh, what's at the beach, you'll find it's a completely different thing. You won't recognize what's going on. Everybody is heavy. Stick around, folks. Got a lot more. I'll be right back. You know what's cool? Taking something that's good for you. Something specifically formulated to help with weight loss, better sleep, stress reduction, and the need to detox. Nico, our hunter and gatherer ancestors found all their nutritional requirements for health in their wild environment. But today, our food sources no longer contain the vitamins, minerals, and nutrients our bodies need to stay healthy and strong. That's why we need Primal Edge Daily Nutrition. It includes a special blend of ionics, oil-based vitamins, minerals, fatty, and amino acids in an easy-to-use liquid form. Primal Edge is powerful by highly concentrated fulvic and humic acids, nature's preferred delivery system. They have been called miracle molecules because, like sunlight, air, and water, life cannot exist without them. That's right, Paige. They ensure we receive all the nutrition we need to be healthy and thrive. We, we take, take it, it every, every morning. morning. Primal Edge, formulated and approved by Nico and Paige of Living a Primal Lifestyle. Buy it today for just $89. Click on the Primal Edge banner on the front page of TFNN.com. 
It's amazing to think that Tom O'Brien started his weekly gold report 17 years ago with the first issue published April 7th, 2002, when gold was trading at under $300 per ounce. Gold peaked at more than $1,900 in 2011, and after spending many years consolidating at lower prices, gold may be poised for its next big run. Tom O'Brien publishes his weekly gold report every Monday morning for subscribers, consisting of coverage of the XAU, HUI, GDX, the dollar, bonds, South African RAND, as well as 25 different mining equities with specific buy-sell recommendations. As of April 1st of this year, the Gold Report currently has eight active positions with an average unrealized profit of almost 8% for each open trade. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. For all the details and to start your Gold Report subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. Don't let gold's next big run pass you by. Sign up today. David White's newsletter, The Technology Insider, is focused like a laser on finding the next big things in technology. If you had invested only $10,000 in Microsoft in 1986, you'd have been a millionaire by 2000. Disruptive technology like Microsoft's is the key to these massive long-term profits, and The Tech Insider is the vehicle from TFNN to capitalize on these opportunities. This is the go-to newsletter that identifies, monitors, and profits on mostly little-known cutting-edge companies with great long-term prospects. David's experience is as an inventor of Emmy-winning animation products for TV and Hollywood that propelled a company public. Match that with 14 years as a full-time trader, and he's uniquely qualified to guide you through the light-speed world of ever-evolving high-tech. If you're ready to ride the next big technology bull market for less than $40 per month, log on to TFNN.com and get your two-week free trial to the Technology Insider. Get in on the ground floor of the next big thing today. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV for the latest market information. Welcome back, folks. Um, I've got this article here, Future Diets and the World's Expanding Wastelands from the New Humanitarian. Uh, where is the best place in the world to eat? It all depends uh, what you mean by good food. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. So here we have a chart, the Oxfam. And the Oxfam here gives you overall the best food and the countries and the worst food. Worst being Chad, I guess, here. The best from France. Uh, Switzerland and the Netherlands and uh, USA is not too far behind here but uh, food in the United States is cheap abundant very tasty but it might be uh, might not all be that good for you too much fat too much sugar combination has led to 36 percent of the Americans being diabetic 46 percent being obese and Japan's food by contrast is much healthier but it's extremely expensive and not as varied and this chart here, you can click different things. Not enough to eat, affordability, food quality. Food quality in the United States is pretty good. Diabetes and uh, obesity. And here are the countries with the worst. Now, a lot of these countries are the uh, really uh, low-income countries, too, because, of course, if you have low income, then the food gets worse and worse. Uh, the mechanism is uh, no mystery. As people get richer, they want to eat more meat, fish, and dairy products, more fried foods, more sweets, more cakes, washing it down with fizzy drinks. Favorite foods vary from country to country, but the dietary transition is the same all over the world. Combined with moving to cities, having less time to cook, and leading less active lives, the dietary shift are brought... Uh, expanding waistlines and the epidemic of ill health. The number of overweight or obese people in the developing world tripled between 1980 and 2008. And of course, from 2008 to now, it's uh, gone off the charts. So Tim Lang, professor of the food policy at the City University in London, has a sense of a world sleep walking into disaster, despite plenty of evidence of what's been happening. He says, for years we have been churning out stunning demographic and epidemiological data documenting the problem. It's almost like seeing in slow motion po populations walking over a cliff and us just watching it, counting them as they go over, saying, well, isn't this terrible? It's really a concern. Oops. Going back to this article here. 
So this will be in the uh, next uh, newsletter, of course. And here we see the, the problem here, the cheeseburger. He says, when we look across the world, there's great uh, variations in Latin America, especially Mexico and some parts of the Middle East and the Pacific Islands. We are seeing very high rates of obesity and overweight. Yet there are other parts of middle income world, especially in South and Southwest East Asia and some parts of East Asia, which are running about half that level. So there must be lessons to be learned from countries of the lower incidence. Uh, for governments wanting to uh, nudge their country's transition to a good direction, the, their policy levers are available. They can ban, ration, or tax unhealthy food, subsidize more nutrition food, and regulate manufacturers to try and educate the public. Education doesn't seem to be working too well when you can't afford the right stuff anyway. Uh, and when we look just at the poor in this country, we're seeing much more weight gain in the poorer sections because they just don't have the money to have the better food. And the better food today in America is more along the paleo-styled uh, lifestyle, so it means more meat, which means that initially at least you're spending more money until your body kind of normalizes and you start eating less automatically. But it doesn't happen immediately. It doesn't happen for everybody either. It really depends on some of the, the factors like uh, what have you been eating and what have your ancestors been eating for the past 10,000 years, let's say. For me, uh, coming over to the Americas, there was a lot of food shock just in the, even in the modern sense of speaking when I switched to the Kellogg's cornflakes uh, and switched to the different types of milk that were here, not the availability of the cheese as much as I had in Holland. Uh, my mother still cooked very tr traditionally, and luckily there were a lot of Dutch uh, little delis around in Canada at the time, and uh, that's dwindling even now. But in this country, you see more of the Mexican, South America type of things. And uh, every neighborhood that has a certain culture will have these little stores where you see their traditional food. And if you go in there, you'll see some of the traditional food that is uh, along the, uh, the lines of the meat and things like that that we ate very, very early. And some of them are the starvation foods that kind of were now what we say tra traditional foods for us because we've incorporated them in. Uh, they become so important. They save our lives and now we have them around and so we start getting them into meals and as your income goes down you add more and more of those foods and that's really what's happening so if we're ta talking about uh, education of the people uh, maybe the government and maybe these food companies aren't the right people to tell us what to be eating maybe we should be looking more like these people are doing looking at some of the more traditional diets uh, substitutes, uh, food subsidies are another thing too. In uh, America, we don't substitute uh, anything except starvation foods, the corn being the main thing, high fructose corn syrup. These are what the farmers are being, and the sugar industry, of course, that's being subsidized. So it's really uh, a misinformation to say that uh, the good food is subsidized, you know, to help the people. It's always the other way around. If we had to eat from a table that you were, uh, and the, you were using the corn maize and you grew it and the farmer had to be paid for what he actually is making there, you couldn't afford it. It, it wouldn't be worth it. The animal is much cheaper in the long run. So there's a lot going on. And most of these studies that I'm getting from uh, these magazines and these articles are usually from the uh, European press or London, uh, you know, the English press. Not too much of that going along right here. A uh, combination of regulation and heavy taxation has been used to reduce smoking with some success despite resistance to, of the tobacco industry, of course. If you're ruining one industry, there's going to be a lot of resistance. Uh, Mexico, which has woken up to the severity of its health problems, uh, introduced a tax on sweetened drinks. Remember the story about Coca-Cola going in there 30 years ago and giving the Board of Education free Coca-Cola for a year. So they put these big vending machines in Mexico to get the children hooked. And even the parents started getting hooked. And now you see everybody with Coke cans and things like that. So these are things that, the com uh, that these companies do to get you hooked onto a certain thing. And now when you're hooked onto the sugar, and remember in, uh, in uh, Mexico, they're still using real sugar in the Coke. So the Coke is actually better than uh, maybe they switched back by now. I don't know. 
So uh, we're coming up on a break here, and I want to remind people, if you want to follow the show, the Health Signals newsletter is the way to do it. A uh, good article here on uh, keto-friendly alcoholic drinks and uh, why maybe you should be recon reconsidering some of these different uh, types of alcohol that really work quite well on the keto-style diet. Eh, I don't like that kind of beer, but all these other things look pretty good. So, you know, if you want to do your own research, this is a good way to do it. You follow the show, uh, you follow what I'm talking about, and you can see where I got my information from, and you can decide whether to use it in a positive or negative way. And uh, we'll be right back in a few minutes. So please, during the break, pick up our Primal Edge or for 310 organic cell-ready liquid ingredients, all there to make you healthy. Please pick that up. I'll be right back. I'm certain you are or strive to be one of the best of the best at everything you do in life. It's the most common trait that we tigers and tigresses share. If you're looking to become the best of the best when it comes to managing your money, let me teach you to do what most wealth managers tell you can't be done, which is how to time the markets. I'm Steve Rhodes, author of Mastering Probability, and for the last 12 months, Timer Digest has been tracking my newsletter signals, which have earned me the ranking as their number one market timer in the nation for the S&P 500 for the last 12 six and three months timer digest also ranks me as the number one market timer for gold as well the fact is markets can be timed and i'll teach you the exact set of tools that i use that has transformed me into one of the best at what i do sign up for mastering probability today by clicking on the newsletter tab on the homepage of tfnn.com and get immediate access to workshops where i take you step by step how to use an extraordinary set of tools as well as provide great market calls too. sign up today Hi folks, Tom O'Brien here. If you'd like to get my daily newsletter, Market Insights, then now is a great time to sign up for a 30-day free trial. Every morning by 9.30, I send out my morning letter to subscribers with market commentary on a variety of markets, currencies, and commodities to keep investors up to date on the day's trading action. Included in Market Insights are specific buy and sell recommendations for stocks, ETFs, and even options, with stops and price targets included for every trade in my newsletter. If you'd like to try my newsletter risk-free for 30 days, then head over to the front page of TFNN and you'll find market insights under trading newsletters. I use my years of trading experience to bisect and dissect the market every morning and give my subscribers the most important information they need to know for the day ahead. I even issue afternoon updates for my subscribers whenever warranted with important market action. I'm always scouring the market for the next great trading opportunity. Sign up for your 30-day free trial to my daily newsletter, Market Insights, today by visiting the front page of TFNN.com. Go get them, folks. TFNN has put together the best lineup of live content for traders by traders every market day, featuring some of the most knowledgeable and respected minds in the business. TFNN broadcasts five days a week, live from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. Eastern Time. We have live programming every market day during market hours. Every morning, Larry Pesavento kicks off the trading day live at 9 a.m. and breaks down the opening bell with Trade What You See. At 10 a.m., Tom and Tommy O'Brien host the TFNN Bull Bear Trading Hour, followed at 11 a.m. by the team at TD Ameritrade and Think or Swim with Fast Market. Basil Chapman hosts the Tiger Technicians Hour at noon, Steve Rhodes at 1 p.m. with the Trader's Edge, Dave White at 2 p.m. with the Power Trading Hour, and Tom O'Brien anchors the daily lineup from 3 till 5 as host of the Tom O'Brien Show. Tune in to TFNN's Tiger TV on your computer or mobile device, and you can always find us streaming on YouTube. TFNN.com, educating investors. And welcome back to the show. Of course, uh, in our modern technology, we have discovered over the last 50, 60 years that uh, meat eating has uh, contributed to uh, heart disease. So, or so we think. But here we have a story that uh, despite meat heavy diet, indigenous people has the world's healthiest hearts. But why? So researchers have discovered that despite meat-heavy uh, diets, low level of good cholesterol and high levels of inflammation, an indigenous South American tribe has the healthiest hearts ever examined and might have something to do with the parasites, uh, parasites excuse me, in the gut. It's kind of an exciting paper, uh, the researcher says. He says, because for a long time we thought that pre-industrial groups had lower levels of heart disease. Uh, 
and he said the uh, these people have the lowest level of plaque in the coronary arteries that we've ever seen. He says one of the key things about this study is we thought the population living these traditional lifestyles had low risk factors, but they are never able to show before that they actually did have these very low levels of the plaque that is in the arteries. This is the first time they've ever shown it. He says 90% of the uh, Samaim people's food come from hunting, fishing, foraging, and farming. Until year, two years ago, none of their communities had electricity, none of them had running water. They live in the Bolivia Amazon with a relatively low contact with the rest of Bolivia. Most still speak their traditional language, and it takes days to get from villages to towns. They eat about the same amount of meat as Americans do, but it's much leaner coming from wild animals. The average hunt for a uh, man takes five or six hours with a range up to 10 miles. Miles. And that's in modern times. Remember when these tribes <clears throat> are indigenous, they don't own that land. They're on uh, wild lands or government lands, and they're being pushed and pushed into the worst, worst conditions. The uh, people in Africa are living in the deserts if you're a nomad, uh, and this really forces them into uh, the uh, the modern world in a sense a lot of them say put on your pants and go to work and get a job instead of the uh, the old way of life but um, he says more than two-thirds of these uh, adults have in, uh, intestinal um, ailments I guess uh, we're out of time here so I'm gonna throw this in the newsletter and I guess I'll continue next time time flies when you're having fun folks see you around bye bye